Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Today we're going to start off in the office because there's a little bit of background that uh, we need to talk about. We're changing the subject today completely away from lenses to a subject that I started to look at exactly three years ago. And it's come back to the surface again. Let me just explain. So back in June 2018, I started work on these things here, which are called laser tiles. Now, at that point in time, I had just developed my compound lens for producing very, very small dots required when you try and do photo engraving. Now, these white tiles look very ordinary, but they're rather special. I had them sent by a correspondent in the USA because I couldn't buy them from the USA directly. As you see, they're completely plain, but when you engrave them with the laser machine, they turn black. And so I was able to make very, very small black dots on this white tile, precision photo engravings. I never got to the bottom of the chemistry of how these worked, but in principle, I fairly soon established with a little bit of research into ceramics that in essence, the white background that's on the tile is something called a high temperature firing glaze, which has got some sort of either mixture of or single metallic oxides in it that respond to very, very high temperatures. Then they cover over this special surface with a normal low temperature firing glaze. So you finished up with a white glazed tile. Now, when the laser beam is very, very tightly focused. The energy that you're firing at this surface creates a huge temperature and that temperature is enough to convert the high temperature glaze that's underneath into a black layer. So we can produce black dots on a white background and leave the glaze on the surface completely untouched. So this is some sort of chemical magic which I never got to the bottom of but it continued to bug me and over the past two or three years on and off I've attempted to not necessarily replicate this but see if I could find a way of adding colour to this glazed surface that's on the tile. In other words by melting some sort of top colour into the glass. Normally when you engrave glass you actually cause like little stone chips and the little bits of glass pop out. If you control the temperature and the dot size very carefully, you can produce something like a little melt pool, like a little volcano. And my attempt really was to try and add some dye or color or pigment to this little melt pool to create black dots my own way. I've done quite a lot of research into ceramics and into glass making because those are the areas where I'm looking to find a clue as to how you can colour ceramics and how you can colour glass. They're nearly one and the same thing because the glazing on top of a tile is some form of glass. Now I've got a website here called Digital Fire which I found extremely useful for tracking down the sort of chemicals that are used for um, ceramic work. A few of them are used for colour. One of the terms that pops up on several of these products is shown here. Opacity. Opacity is an interesting term because for instance this tin oxide here is actually white. So one has to assume that if you were to apply a white oxide to a white tile it would have no effect at all. The word opacity is a very interesting word because it crops up quite a few times on some of these products. Now, as I said, my general idea was to try and find some sort of metal oxide which produced dark colours in ceramics. And one of those, for instance, here is called manganese dioxide. And you can see it says manganese is a colourant used in bodies and glazes producing blacks, browns and purples. Perfect. Just what I'm after. So I took a quick look to see how easily manganese dioxide was available and there it is, 
It's available on eBay and it's not incredibly expensive at around about, uh, as it says, £44 a kilogram, but I could buy 100 grams for £4.40. Um, so that's not particularly expensive. And there we go, it's a black powder. Rather than spend that money initially, I thought, hang on, black powder? What have I got in my workshop? I know what I've got in my workshop. I've got some black powder that I can spray on. It's called this, look, graphite 33. It's graphite, carbon, black. That should work. To be honest, it didn't. That was a total failure. So why spend money on manganese when I've already proved that I cannot bond a black paint or a black carbon and melt it into glass? I basically stopped trying this about maybe a year ago. Stopped looking for products that would bond to glass. Now the reason why I'm reviving my interest in ceramic etching is because in the last couple of months I've had three separate individuals ask me virtually the same question. They all have the 450 nanometer blue diode lasers and they all happen to be using the Norton process for etching onto white tiles. Now I didn't know much about the Norton process until I did a little investigation, but each one of them asked me the question, can the Norton process work on a CO2 laser? Which is a completely different wavelength of light, 10,600 nanometers, as opposed to 450 nanometer wavelength. I didn't really know the answer to that question, as I said, I've always been fascinated by the process. So somewhere along the way, there must be some chemicals which turn black when you expose them to laser light. And it turns out that the Norton process involves buying just an ordinary white tile, which does not engrave black, but painting the surface of the tile with a, I wouldn't say special, but it seems that most people are using a Rust-Oleum white paint. And when you expose this white paint to 450 nanometer laser light, it turns black. It's a pretty well tried process of painting white tiles with black paint and then etching the paint off to leave a white background it can produce a pretty stunning result. I don't know for certain, but my guess is that somebody with one of these blue laser machines decided it might look good if you tried the process the other way round, i.e. you take a black tile and paint it white. And accidentally, they found that it didn't. It produced black on a black tile. Pretty bloody useless, hey? Until you try painting white tile with white paint. And then all of a sudden, you get black on a white tile. So I think that this was an accidental find on somebody's part, maybe a year ago. It does give us a bit of a clue as to what might be going on. Now this Norton process may or may not be the same process that's taking place in the laser tile. That really started my interest off again to do the research into exactly what's happening. Now burning is not what's taking place because burning is something that takes place on wood or organic materials. There we go, look, we've got brown wood. I've cut it and I've produced a black surface because this is carbon. I've changed the wood into carbon. Now that's definitely not the process that's happening when we engrave a laser tile. To help us decode the next part of this puzzle, we need to understand just a small amount of physics. Light from the sun is basically white light. Within white light, there are all these colors. You mix all these colors together, and in light terms, you finish up with white. But how come I see red there as well? Well, the reason we see red as opposed to white is because the white light is shining on this surface and the 
absorption of this surface is nil. Therefore, we get all of these colours reflected back into our eyes. And all of these colours, when they mix together, create white. So what happens about red? Well, we perceive colour because of absorption of light, not reflection of light. So we see red because all of the blues, greens and yellows are being absorbed by whatever the pigmentation is in this piece of paper. And the only colour that you see reflected back into your eye is the red. And that is how we see colour. OK, so what colour is that? Yeah, it's black. Well, no, it might be a black colour to us. But in reality, what that means is white reflects all of the white light and black is reflecting none of the white light. All of those colours are being absorbed by this surface. We are not getting any colour transmission back from this and therefore it is black. That's an important physics fact that you need to understand because we're not burning colour when we perform this process here. What we're doing, we're doing something to the glaze that is not burning it. What we're doing, we're changing the structure of the material so that it absorbs the light rather than reflect the light. Here we've got reflection of all the white light and here we've got reflection of none of the white light. So we're causing some sort of physical change to the structure of the material to cause the difference between these two conditions. That's how I believe the physics is working. My attempt at fusing black into the surface of the glass or the glaze turned out to be a total failure. And it's not the only material that I used. I've tried several other materials. I've tried black paints. I've tried, tried galvanizing paints. I've tried several other different chemical compounds to try and see if I can create some sort of surface effect on the glazed tile. All to no avail. So it was a bit puzzling to me when I came across the Norton process that they were using white paint. Or was it that much of a puzzle? We've got a white glaze here, which I'm turning black. But I don't know how it's turning black, other than it's some sort of physical change in the material structure, which is absorbing rather than reflecting the light. Now, when I return to my uh, Digital Fire website and start looking at some of these other metal oxides, um, one of the oxides that was very low on my list of priorities but it was one of these oxides that carried this term opacifier. It's a product which turns things opaque. Now this is transparent and this is opaque. This is opaque because you can't see through it. So basically opacity or an opacifier means it's going to turn something from clear glass to something that's not clear glass. OK, so this titanium dioxide is a white powder, just like flour. A white opaque glaze on a white tile It's not going to give me what I want. So it seemed a little bit illogical to think that such a product as titanium dioxide would be of any use in this application until I started to do some research. What is titanium dioxide? It is a very bright white pigment that's used in paints, glue, plastics, paper, pharmaceuticals, sunscreen and food. So it's not exactly a toxic product if it's used in food. And here we are at the bottom, yet another clue. It is the whitest and brightest of known pigments with reflective qualities. It can also both scatter and absorb UV rays. The absorption of UV rays seems to be yet another clue in the decoding of this problem because a blue diode is visible and it's sitting here at 450 nanometers wavelength. Now it's in the visible spectrum 
but it's in the visible spectrum and it's just on the top edge of this ultraviolet radiation zone. So hang on, it's absorbed by UV rays. Absorption means we're exciting molecules and exciting molecules means we heat them up. So this powder, this pigment, is very susceptible to being heated up by blue wavelength light. Okay, it's not just any ordinary blue wavelength light, it's got to be coherent laser light, very high intensity light being fired at this material, which will cause it to heat up. Our 10.6 micron wavelength CO2 light is somewhere about here. Okay, now this is a very broad spectrum light, which is capable of shaking, vibrating, exciting, call it what term you like. The net result is it will heat up material. So our 10.6 micron wavelength light probably has got sufficient scope, sufficient energy to work in this region as well. Then we read down further and we find that titanium dioxide is also known as the perfect white for the whitest white due to its powerful pure whitening qualities. Its high refractive index means that as a pigment it is able to scatter visible light and creates a bright reflective quality when applied to a surface or incorporated into a product. Okay, so this is why it's used as a white paint. That's still not helping us very much. It's also used as a food colourant E171, so it tells us it's not a toxic product. It has an extremely high melting point, 1,843 degrees C, and it boils off at nearly 3,000 degrees C. Pigment grade titanium dioxide particles, as I said, this stuff looks like flour, are approximately 200 to 350 nanometers in dimension. You see how the size of the product can affect its light reflecting properties because the next part says nano or ultra fine titanium dioxide comprises of primary particles sized less than a hundred nanometers. And in this grade, titanium dioxide is transparent. So grind it fine enough and it looks like this. Titanium dioxide is typically thought of as being chemically inert, meaning it doesn't react with other chemicals and is therefore a stable substance that can be used in many different industries and for a variety of applications. Now that could be good and that could be bad. Let's just stop and think about that for a moment. Chemically inert comes back to what I was speaking about earlier. It can't be burnt. It can't be transformed into some other chemical like wood mixes with oxygen and changes into a different chemical structure. So whatever we do to this material when we heat it, it's got to be able to change its properties from reflective to absorptive. The particle size of this white flower is down at two to three hundred nanometers. It is very light reflective. But I wondered what sort of form titanium dioxide took in nature. In its natural form, crystal form, it's black. It's absorbing light. It's not reflecting light. It's only when you break this product down into its very, very small micro crystal structure that it starts to become white. It reflects the light in a different way. But when we put all the crystals together into a big block, they absorb the light. So this gives us maybe a little bit of a clue as to how we might go about creating black from white. If we can heat those white micro crystals, which are very good at reflecting light, into a bigger group of crystals, and we can do that by heating them up and turning them into a liquid, but to do that, of course, we have to get above 2000 degrees C. Now, in the early part of my engineering career, metallurgy, was a small part of my education. But one of the things that I do remember very clearly about crystal structures which occur in metals and other substances is that the rate at which you cool a molten material can change the crystal structure that you create. I don't know how this black material 
was created, whether it was created because of fast cooling or because of slow cooling, whether it was by very unlikely by sedimentation, because this sort of stuff happens to it normally happens in igneous rock, volcanic rock. And that comes back to, as I hinted at earlier, when we talked about laser tiles, and I hadn't got a clue what I was talking about then, that we were getting some sort of mechanical change to the structure. So here we are beginning to see a clue that probably is the mechanism that gives us what we're after. We're going to change light reflective white microcrystals into much larger black light absorbing crystals. How do we prove this? Where do we start? To be honest, the last thing I'm going to do is try engraving on tile. I've now bought some titanium oxide, which arrived just before I went on holiday, and I'm now keen to play with it to see what sort of properties it's got. I'm not particularly interested in being able to produce wonderful black and white images on a ceramic tile. That's a secondary issue to me. I really want to understand what the mechanism is behind this process called the Norton process. If how I think it works is correct, then we should be able to make this work with a CO2 laser as well. We might not be able to heat this white material up as efficiently as a blue laser. If we can heat it up above its melting point, 2000 degrees C, then we should be able to do something with the crystal structure to make it turn black. If I can decode the chemistry and the physics of this, then yeah, we've got a good chance of being able to transpose it onto a CO2 laser machine. Okay, so what I'm planning to do is I've got my little dot test on here, which I've already set and done in a piece of acrylic. Now, the reason I'm using acrylic is because I can see how deep the engraving is. And what I want to do is to just put a small amount on so that I can do my dot test through the film. that slurry will dry quite quickly because it's fixed up with isopropyl alcohol. Now I've got no idea what power and speed I should be using to do this but the reason I'm doing it on uh, acrylic is because I will be able to burn through this film and not do any damage to anything underneath. If I put it on metal or anything else I will get reflections back up. I don't want reflections. What I want to do is to see what the heating effect is on this product. Now, my first reaction to that is, and we'll look at this under the microscope, it's burnt right through. I know you're going to say, well yeah, that's, that's pretty damned obvious it's going to do that. Yeah, but what that means is, I've evaporated not only the acrylic underneath, but I've also evaporated the titanium dioxide on the surface. And remember that to evaporate that titanium dioxide, I've got to be above 3000 degrees C. The light does not penetrate through material like a drill. It can only vibrate the surface molecules. And so to get through those surface molecules, I've had to heat it up beyond 3000 degrees C so that I can get down to the acrylic underneath. It's a difficult concept for many people to understand how the mechanics of this laser beam actually works on materials. This is a very short focus lens, remember, because this is the compound lens. I'm going to drop this focus down by, say, two millimeters. And now I'm going to drop it down by another two millimetres. And now I'm going to drop it down by another two millimetres. As I drop it down, the beam is getting softer, weaker and less able to do damage. I'm basically decreasing the intensity of the beam that's hitting the surface. OK, this last one is ten millimetres below the focal point. What we're now going to do is go and take a look at those under the microscope to see if at any of those powers we have been able to create any blackness in that white. 
Well, we've already got some very interesting signs under the microscope here. This is only at 50 times magnification. Now I've done some disturbance here. Now the problem with acrylic is if you're not careful you can be misled because acrylic boils and as it boils and it produces bubbles on the surface. Now what we've got to do is look for pieces of this crust around the outside here which has actually transformed away from microcrystals into black solid. These little things in here look like bubbles and they are bubbles inside the acrylic. I can probably turn on another light and you can see them more clearly. Right? They are actually in the hole but what I've been able to do here just around the edge of this hole I identified these things here look can you see these these are pieces they're globules of titanium dioxide. How do I know that? Well, let me see if I can be very careful with this and I'll see if I can get in there with a hypodermic needle and look, I think I might have been able to lift it off. Aha! Now this is on white paper. We've got some real pieces of titanium dioxide, solid titanium dioxide. And what colour are they? Black! Whoopee! Now let's just go and have a look at those at 400 times magnification and there it is look. So that's solid titanium dioxide attached to the white powdery stuff. Wow look at that that's a lovely you can see that that's a molten shape because look it's like a blob of solder and we can see here look like an intercrystalline state where it starts to change from very small microcrystals as I said, the crystal structure changes as the cooling rate changes. Look at these large crystals here. Fascinating, isn't it? So this piece has come off all in one piece because it's no longer a powder. It's actually a partial melt. I have to say it's fairly satisfying when theory turns into reality. So I think we now understand how the Norton process works. The problem is, how do we control it? What are the parameters? What are the temperatures? Because this blob only occurred around the edge of the holes. So when we turn our white LED lights on, that are shining down onto the surface at an acute angle, this is the picture that we get. This is the pattern, our dot pattern, in just raw acrylic. So you can see the sort of shape that we get. We get the nice little hole and look we've got a little teeny weeny volcanic eruption around the edge where the material that's been blown out of here it's, it's like a melt material you get a melt in there and you get evaporation. Well the explosive evaporation is forced the melt up over the surface here okay and so you have to be very careful when you look at these pictures the next pictures that I'm going to show you because look around the edge you automatically create these bubbles and these marks now you have to be very careful that you don't confuse those with solid material that we're trying to produce in titanium dioxide so let's look at exactly the same pattern done through a layer of titanium dioxide and you can see the milk pattern around the outside this is a very focused beam very focused but even so look we've got some areas around here which look as though they are more than just a little melt pattern around the outside. There's definitely some change around these holes here and these spots here. Now they're nothing to do with the melt pattern itself because look you can see the eruption pattern around here. This is something to do with the heating on the outer part, the cooler part of the beam. So it gives the impression that we don't need the tremendous heat from the centre of the beam to produce this effect. Now I'm using 50 
percent power here which is a huge amount of power for doing this test I normally do this test at probably 12 14 percent and as I mentioned to you when we were at the machine we've got to burn through this white layer molecule by molecule by molecule we've got to evaporate each of these molecules to get through to the acrylic underneath and remember 3000 degrees C it takes to evaporate this white material so that shows you the temperature that must exist to cause this amount of damage to make it evaporate and then to cause this amount of damage out here and produce melting we've still got to have close on 2000 degrees C if I turn on the top light the yellow light then this is the um, this is the halogen light that gives a completely different view of things and it's more confusing in some way it actually shows these up very well we've got some solid blobs just here these are actually bubbles of acrylic we've got some more here look around the extremity another one there so it's on the low temperature side this is now six millimeters out of focus and I have been along these and I've scraped these so these are not very pure question is if we can produce a glass melt and a titanium oxide melt because they're both melted they might not fuse together in terms of mixing but they might stick together and that's all we really want okay so I have to admit it I've been a little bit impatient and I decided I would um, do a quick trial on a piece of tile. We'll take a look at these under the microscope starting right at the top there 200 millimeters a second 50% power. With that much power we look as though we're burning into the glaze quite a lot and we're not actually making much impression with color. That may well be due to the paintbrush effect where I wasn't getting the titanium oxide on in a nice uniform layer. All right, so that may account for some of these little problems here where we haven't got any colour. Where we do have colour, it's not all that distinct, is it? So we'll drop it to 40% and see what happens. Well, we're getting some distinct colour now down the centre of those dashes. And it still looks a bit like frog spawn. So let's drop it down to 30% power. Mm. it's getting better we've got a more uniform sort of pattern now 20% power you know, they're not bad the dots are quite big but they've got color in the middle which is I must point out to you when we reduce power what we're doing we're reducing the spikiness we're making the pencil instead of it sharp at high power we're making getting towards blunt we're getting less intensity variation across the dot so we're making even when we reduce the power we're making the beam what I call softer we're getting less central intensity and that may well be why we've got our central intensity coming in now because we've got lower power and we've got less intensity in the center now this is the sort of thing that I'm really looking for single dots and the single dots seem to be coming in quite nicely at about 18 percent now 14% is getting a bit inconsistent because I think the power is getting a bit low now. That's just changing the power. If we go up to something like about 40%, which is this, which is not very good at all, and change the speed to 200, from 200 up to 400, we will basically halve the power of this. And halving the power of this will bring us down to something closer to this one. and that may well perform quite well so <clears throat> I think we'll finish the session there because I think we've proven beyond any doubt the possibility of being able to produce some quite good images with this technique but I've got to wait a little while for the for the delivery of some isopropyl alcohol so I can make a decent spray because inconsistency of the film thickness is going to cause me all sorts of problems so I think that's a fairly satisfactory session where we've proved that a 
we understand now where the colouring comes from and B we can probably on a CO2 laser do some quite reasonable photo engraving work. So I think we'll experiment with some pictures in the next session. Thanks for your time and patience and I'll catch up with you then.